as everyone has mentioned here, the focus of the future is really personalized medicine. And to me, one of the greatest uh, innovations is really our ability to use and understand our DNA to treat our patients. The question is, what are we using our DNA for? Well, currently at St. Paul's in our clinics, we're using DNA or sequencing testing to diagnose problems, to predict problems that haven't yet happened. We want to prevent downstream problems that are around the corner. We also want to personalize medicine. Lots of people have said different ways to personalize medicine, and I'll give you a couple more in this talk. We want to target the problem, and I think that's really important. Finally, we want to treat the problem, and ultimately our goal is cure. And there are some technologies I'm going to show you in the next five to seven minutes that are curative, and it's really unbelievable. So this is a little bit about DNA testing. This is something to explain to you why this is new. And really, DNA testing or sequencing is not new, but it used to be very expensive. So when we look at the whole genome project, it was about $100 million to sequence someone's DNA. And now we're down to anywhere close to $1,000. So this has become an accessible technology for our population, not just for rare individuals. Because of that, now we're looking at more and more of the DNA for each individual patient. In 2003, in our own clinic, we used to look at maybe one gene, which encoded one protein, which was one small building block of the heart. Now we're looking at hundreds, soon we'll be looking at thousands, all at the same time. The problem is, is that we have so much data, and everyone's talked about data, that it's too much to really understand what's happening at a single individual. So right now in DNA, what we do is we put hundreds and thousands of people together to try to understand what's going on. This is kind of the exact opposite of the paradigm that we're thinking of in personalized medicine. This goes back to my training when we'd study patients or drugs and do clinical trials of 20,000 people all at the same time. We'd know that overall people would benefit, but we wouldn't know who would benefit, and we wouldn't know which individual would be harmed. We need a new way of thinking about this because these are the blockbuster drugs in North America. These are drugs that have sales over a billion dollars. Now, the problem is, is that each of these little blue people are people who benefit from those drugs. And all of the red people are people that take the medication, receive no benefit, and yet are at risk of harm. We need to somehow pick out that blue person, figure out who they are, and how we can treat them individually. This is a case example of how we're doing this right now at St. Paul's. This is a young girl who had a cardiac arrest. She was at a summer camp right beside BC Children's Hospital and fainted while running on the track. EMS came and resuscitated her. She was shocked. She was brought to hospital. She underwent a series of investigations. Unfortunately, there was no cause identified for why she passed away and was successfully resuscitated. That's when we start using DNA testing genomic medicine, looking for a cause. We did this on a research protocol with a group of about 300 patients where we looked at all of the DNA all at the same time because they had unexplained episodes of cardiac arrest. And in this young girl, we were able to find out of these 3 billion base pairs or 3 billion letters that, that code her DNA, out of 20,000 genes of all the genes that instruct the proteins for the building blocks of her heart cells, one spelling mistake. What do we do with this one spelling mistake? This doesn't necessarily answer why she had a cardiac arrest or why she should be treated or how. So now what we do is we take her, and as uh, Dick Vallette explained, we take a blood sample. From that blood sample, we're able to isolate very specialized blood cells called white blood cells or T cells, part of your immune system. We're able to reprogram those blood cells back to pluripotent stem cells. So now we've trained these cells to a very early point in their heritage where they have the opportunity to become any type of heart cells. And what we're able to do is turn these stem cells, these patient-specific stem cells, into heart cells. And now these cells are beating quite happily in our dish. And then we put together millions of these heart cells and we build heart tissues. And this heart tissue is now beating very happily in our dish about 60 beats per minute when left alone. This is what the heart's tissue looks like. This is a small 35 millimeter Petri dish. Um, and this is about two and a half million heart cells. And you can see 
the heart cells have a pacemaker like cell, which starts off an electrical propagation, which allows the whole tissue to contract, just like your own heart would. So now we have healthy heart tissue. And when we look at it under a microscope, this is what it looks like. But we want to study abnormal heart rhythm. So we have to create a disease in a dish. Um, this is what we call normal rhythm or sinus rhythm. And this is an arrhythmia. This is a heart rhythm disorder in our dish. So now we can have health and disease modeled in our dish in a very patient specific way. And we can treat this disease in our dish to correct the problem. The way that we do that is we study the disease in more detail. On the right, you can see normal rhythm. On the left, you can see the abnormal rhythm. This is actually the electricity that propagates in the heart tissue. We're able to measure this electricity and record it. And then we can perturb it with different drugs to try to correct the abnormal rhythm. If we want to treat populations, we need to move to a more automated, more high throughput system. This is a system that we're building at Simon Fraser University. This is a robotic arm that's able to do the experimentation for us. We're able to now move to a place where we can study hundreds of patient cell lines, hundreds and thousands of different compounds, and study them in the manner of one or two days. These are big data sets, um, and certainly we're working with the largest data sets that anyone is working with to date in this field. Where are we going? I told you that there is going to be a cure, and there is. So this is genome editing. We're now able to repair the abnormal DNA, and the FDA predicts that there will be about 25 drugs that will be involved in either DNA editing or gene therapy that will be approved every year. There's already been some amazing drugs that have come out that will cure problems at birth that would have had lifelong problems. Personalized tools, so what are the overall arching plan for each individual patient? Well, we see a patient, but we also see families in our clinics. Um, we're using smartphone technology, Bluetooth technology, wearable technology, really any information we can get. We're doing different profiling, looking at big data sets. We're looking at DNA, we're doing genetic editing and repair. We're able to make stem cells. We're able to make disease and a dish models. These are things we're working on now. These are 3D tissues looking at heart contraction. Um, on the left, this is our collaborator in Israel. On the right, this is our collaborator in Washington who uses MRIs from the patient and integrates all that other information to create mathematical models of abnormal heart rhythms. Our goal is to predict, prevent, and cure problems. Mm -hmm.